All right, so one seven is what we're gonna do today, and one seven is inequalities in one variable. So inequalities being greater than, less than, greater than, or equal to. So we've got a lot of overlap in like the solving of the equations, but then obviously it's a little bit different because this is no longer an equals, this is now an inequality. So when we're solving linear inequalities, the same rules apply as you're solving equations with one major exception, and that's when you divide or multiply both sides of the equation by a negative number. When you do that, you change the direction of the inequality sign. So if I had something like negative 2x is greater than 10, then when I divide both sides by that negative 2, my greater than sign changes to less than. And if I had something like x over negative 2 is greater than 10, and I would multiply both sides by the negative 2, it also changes directions. So a, a dividing or a multiplying. Now that doesn't mean like if I'm distributing a negative on one side, I have to flip it or anything like that, but when it happens to both sides, that's when that happens. All right, so, and then also your answers will be an inequality statement and it will be graphed or it will be given an interval notation. So we're gonna talk about interval notation in a second, but obviously the inequality statement is like this, x is less than five, x is greater than negative two, whatever that is, that's an inequality statement. The graph you'll actually do on a number line, which we're gonna practice on the next slide. And then interval notation is something that looks like this. It represents the numbers in which are included in that answer set. So if it says x is less than negative five, we're talking from negative five all the way down to negative infinity, anything that's less than it. And that's what interval notation is. So pay attention to, obviously on WebAssign, it's gonna be kind of obvious. If it gives you a graph, you have to graph it. And then it might, it'll, answer, it'll say, write your answer in interval notation, and that's what it means. This is how we do interval notation. So we're going to graph on the number line, and we're going to do interval notation. We're just going to review it. How many of you have seen that before? Never, right? A couple of you? Okay, good. Usually, this is where it switches. Like, in previous years, you would have seen, like, the inequality statement, like, x is greater than, let's say it says x is greater than 3. You might have seen that as your answer. And then if it asked you to graph it, it would have been an open dot on three. So I would give three numbers so I understand that I'm going increasing to the right. And I would have given an open dot and the arrow would have pointed to the right. Sounds familiar, right? Like again, my sons are in pre-algebra. They're doing exactly that right now. What the difference is when you get to interval notation is instead of open dots, we use parentheses. And instead of solid dots, we use brackets. So that open dot, so that open dot becomes a parentheses because it's not or equal to, it's just greater than. So my parentheses is gonna be on the number and it's gonna point to the right. If you're talking about like what values actually are true for this, three itself does not work because it has to be greater than three. But 3.0000001 technically works and you can't graph that. So you put on the three, the parentheses, and then you arrow it in whichever direction, greater than to the right, less than to the left. And then your interval notation mirrors that. So I'm gonna put a three with a parentheses on the three. And then my arrow to the right is represented by infinity because we're saying take that, and as far as you can go to the right, which would be infinity, infinity itself is not a number. So it will never get a bracket. It will always get a parentheses. If it's less than a number, so let's say it's less than three, I would do the same thing on my number line, two, three, four. This time it's a parentheses, but it points to the left because that's where numbers are less than three. And then my interval notation goes from negative infinity up to three with a parentheses on the three because we want to not include the three. So arrow to the right goes to positive infinity, arrow to the left goes to negative infinity. With me so far. So now all that changes if it's less than or equal to or greater than or equal to is we now use the bracket instead of the parentheses. So if it's greater than a number, greater than or equal to, I would say like greater than or equal to three, then I'm gonna get two, three, four, and it's gonna be a bracket on the three 
greater than points to the right. And then my interval notation mirrors that bracket on the three points to the right. <coughs> if it's less than or equal to a number, it's going to get a bracket, but less than points left. And my interval notation is negative infinity to three with a bracket on the three. So those are gonna be your normal single inequality statements. And then we get into what are called compound inequality statements. And these are gonna have more than one inequality. So there's either an and statement or an or statement. If it's less than this and greater than this, like the next row, it would look something like this. Like it's greater than negative 2, but less than 1. So I'm going to plot both those points. You could literally just put the negative 2 and the 1. And because they're not or equal to, it's just less than, I put a parentheses on both and I shade in between. So this part says it's greater than negative 2, but this part says it has to be less than 1. If I had plotted that like individually, let's say you plot it individually, the first one, the negative 2 being greater than it would have pointed all the way to the right, and the positive 1 being less than it would have pointed to the left. And this is an and statement when it's built into one thing. Ors will have the word or in it, okay? The and statement is only true where it overlaps, which is why it's only shaded in between those. The arrows on the outside wouldn't work because it's not true for both. Okay, what changes on the next one is the or equal to, which means now I'm going to get brackets. So if it was x is greater than or equal to negative 2, but less than or equal to 1, same thing, negative 2 and 1. This time it would get brackets. And you'd shade in between. Oh, sorry, I didn't do the interval notation on the last one. Interval notation is from negative 2 to positive 1 with a parentheses on both. And the next one is from negative 2 to positive 1 with a bracket on both. My or statement means it can be true for either part. So if it says x is less than negative 2 or x is greater than 1, I would plot the negative 2 and the 1. Less than negative 2 is a parenthesis on the negative 2 pointing to the left. Greater than 1 is a parenthesis on the 1 pointing to the right. If this was an and statement, it would be no solution because there's no overlap. But this is an or statement, which means I leave it as it is. Wherever those are shaded is my answer. And the interval notation on this goes from negative infinity to negative 2 with a parenthesis on the negative 2. <coughs> and then or the symbol is this little u, which is called union. And it means either of these. And then it'd go from positive 1 to positive infinity. So that little u means union, which means it can come from either of these sets, which is the same thing as or. So this takes the place of the word or. And then the last one, the only thing that changes is the brackets. So if it was x is less than or equal to negative 2 or x is greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1, then I've got my negative 2, my positive 1, bracket on the negative 2, points left, bracket on the positive 1, points right. And I get negative infinity to negative 2, bracket, union, positive 1 to positive infinity.
Now, obviously, we're going to get a lot of variations of this, but you can see one with like one or equals two and one not, and that means you're going to get one parentheses and one bracket. That's totally fine. So if it had said it's greater than negative one but less than or equal to three, that's going to be a parentheses on the negative one and a bracket on the three. So it would be negative one to three like that. That can totally happen. So again, it doesn't mean that if you have one parentheses, you have to have both. And then again, remember that there's never a bracket on infinity. Infinity will always have a parentheses. <coughs> Questions so far? So that's really just how we'll write the answers. Obviously, the rest of this comes from the actual solving. Yeah, Sean. So if I'm okay, so if this is an or statement, negative 2, positive 1. The greater than negative 2 would be a parentheses on negative 2 pointing to the right. The less than 1 would be a parentheses on 1 pointing to the left. In an or statement, you shade whatever's there. So this is actually an all real numbers case. So yep, oh. for or. Yeah. And it would be negative infinity to positive infinity because my arrow points both directions. If it was an and statement, so like an and statement that says x is less than negative 1 and x is greater than 2, or x is in the middle and it says greater than negative 1. Wait, I want to go the other way. Less than negative 1. Greater than 2. That, if I graph that separately, negative 1, 2. Less than negative 1 would go this direction. Greater than 2 would go this direction. And this is an and statement, so it only counts where it overlaps. This would be no solution. Yeah. <coughs> And there is no interval notation for that because there's no solution for it. So if it was, like if you're pointing to the left and it's negative infinity, that has to come first. The order of interval notation is smaller to larger. So negative infinity will always be smaller than positive infinity. The negative will always come first. That's how you would write all real numbers. All right. So let's do this. Solve, graph, and put it in interval notation. So we're going to solve it, then we're going to put it on the graph, then we're going to put it in interval notation. All right, so the, hopefully the easy part is the solving, right? We're used to that. So I'm going to subtract the 3x from both sides. 2x minus 7 is greater than 9. I'm going to add the 7. 2x is greater than 16. Divide by 2. And x is greater than 8. Now goes my number line. Greater than 8, so like 6, well, 7, 8, 9. I put up parentheses on 8, and I point it to the right because that's where it would be greater than 8. And then my interval notation, parentheses on the 8, points to the right, means it goes to positive infinity. No, because it has to go smaller to larger. So infinity, positive infinity will always be the right. Negative infinity would always be the left has to go in order smaller to larger. <coughs> yeah. Um, I, I would assume we would take points off for that. Yeah. I don't know how much, but yes. All right, go to 2. So again, subtract the 2x. 5x minus 3 is less than or equal to 7. Add the 3. 5x less than or equal to 10. Divide by 5 x is less than or equal to 2. So my number line gets a 1, 2, 3. A bracket this time on the 2 pointing to the left because that's less than. And then it's negative infinity to 2 with a bracket on the 2. It should mirror your graph and an arrow is always infinity and an arrow and infinity can never have a bracket because you can't include infinity. Like I can't ask you for infinity amount of dollars, right? That's not a, a specific money or, or a specific number. Okay, three. So obviously now they just get a little bit more complicated. We've got two X's, we've got fractions. What could you do to get rid of that fraction? Good, so it goes everywhere. The two goes here, the two goes here, the two goes here, the two goes here. So I get two minus the denominator on that three cancels. Three X is greater than or equal to two X minus eight. 
and then I'd add the 3x. 2 is greater than or equal to 5x minus 8, and then I add the 8. 10 is greater than or equal to 5x, and divide both sides by 5. <coughs> 2 is greater than or equal to x. So you can write your answer like that, like there's nothing wrong with that, but our brains tend to go left to right. So if you can, I would always switch it so that the variable's on the left, because I think that's easier to graph it. So if the variable switches to the left, the greater part still points to the two, which means this would be x is less than or equal to two. So those are the same statements, I just flip flopped it. And now my number line goes one, two, three, I get a bracket and it's less than, so I point it to the left. And then my interval notation, negative infinity to two with a bracket on the two. Okay, so I would do the same thing for four. <laughs> I would multiply everything by the denominator, so I'm gonna multiply by three. So it goes here, 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 and here. I get six minus five X is greater than three X minus 18. Then I want to add the 5x. 6 is greater than 8x minus 18. Add the 18. 24 is greater than 8x. Divide both sides by 8. And x would be less than 3, or 3 is greater than x. If I flip that around, I can graph it. 2, 3, 4. Parentheses on the three, less than goes left. Questions? Not bad, right, so far? All right. Now you've got your compound inequalities. So they become compound when you've got more than one inequality. If you look at all of these, they have more than one less than or greater than symbol. If they are built into one statement, which these all are, these are and statements, okay? If it says the word or, which you'll see on the next slide, it says the word or, obviously those are or statements. So your and statement, whatever you do to the middle, you're gonna do to both sides. And then when you go to graph it, your answer only works where the lines overlap. So if I start with five, I would add two to the middle and to both of the left and the right, I get negative two is less than or equal to five X, which is less than nine. And then I divide everything by five. And I get negative 2 fifths is less than or equal at x, which is less than 9 fifths. You can totally leave it like that. You can put them into improper, like the 9 fifths. You could change it into an improper number so that you know where to graph it. Especially on WebAssign, you're going to have to get pretty accurate on your graph. If you're getting frustrated at the like putting of the point or the bracket, whatever, on WebAssign, remember that if you have it in notability, it's fine. So like as long as you have it, because you're going to, it's not a digital test. I'd rather you be able to know how to write it out than be able to pick it on the web assigned questions. If you want the green check, try for it. But something like nine over five is gonna be hard to get exact because it's not a whole number. Does that make sense? And I'd rather you be able to do it on a notability document than on the web assigned. So don't stress if that's the part you're getting wrong. You still wanna enter in the inequality to see that you're right. But the graph, I would say stop. Don't stress about it, okay? I know that stuff can be frustrating when you're trying to catch it on like a digital interface. All right, so I'm going to graph my number line. Negative 2 fifths is smaller than 9 fifths. The 2 fifths gets a bracket, and we're saying it's greater than, which means it would point this way. The 9 fifths gets a parentheses, and we're saying it's less than, so it would point this way. And then again, remember, we're only doing where this overlaps for an and statement. So it's bracket 2 fifths, 2 parentheses, 9 fifths. <coughs> and my interval notation mirrors that negative two fifths to nine fifths parentheses on the nine fifths bracket on the negative two fifths okay go to six Another and statement. So whatever I do to the middle, plus one, plus one, plus one is negative two, less than or equal to six X, which is less than four. Divide both sides by six. 
and I reduce. So negative one-third is less than or equal to x, which is less than two-thirds. So negative one-third to two-thirds. As long as that is in order least to greatest and the x is in between, then your signs should go to the right, and that, should be, that would be fine. If you want to keep checking it, this says greater than, which means bracket here points to the right. This is less than, parentheses here, points to the left, and we keep it where it overlaps. So this would be bracket negative one-third, comma two-thirds with a parentheses. For seven, I'm gonna subtract the seven from all three spots. Negative six is less than x, two x, sorry, which is less than four, divide by two. Negative three is less than x, which is less than two. Negative three, positive two. This time it's a parentheses. Greater than would point to the right. Parentheses, less than would point to the left, so I shade in between. when it's an and statement, but it also has to make sense that it's an and statement, right? It has to be greater than the smaller number, but less than the bigger one. If that was reversed, this would be no solution because it would go the other directions. Sam? Yep. On, not on all of them, but on some of them, yes. Yep. All right, eight. I'm gonna get rid of that three. Multiply each term by the three. <laughs> Negative 12 is less than or equal to the threes cancel here, two minus three X, which is less than 15. I'm gonna subtract the two, negative 14, less than or equal to negative three X, which is less than 13. Divide by negative three, what happens when I divide by negative? negative. My signs flip, so this becomes 14 thirds is greater than or equal to X, which is greater than negative 13 thirds. So that interval, I mean, that inequality notation is not in order from least to greatest. Otherwise, the negative 13 over 3 would be on the left. So if that throws you, switch it. If you can graph it knowing that it's reversed, it's totally fine. Like, this answer is fine. But because that negative 13 thirds is smaller, it should come first. The big part of the inequality should still face the x, so it should be less than x, which is less than or equal to 14 thirds. So we're saying x has to be greater than 13 thirds, which gets a parentheses, points to the right, less than 14 thirds, which less than or equal to, which gets a bracket, points to the left. And because it's an and statement, it's only where it overlaps. So this would be negative 13 thirds to 14 thirds with a bracket on the 14 thirds. Sam. I'm sorry, Sean. <laughs> so, like, the second you see the two signs pointing at each other, you can already, like, tell that's no solution, right? You mean, like, the, they're like, faced in? Yeah, say they're both faced in. Okay. If it's an and statement. Right. Yeah, or if they're facing the other direction, it would be wrong. Because you can't have something great, less than negative 13 thirds and greater than 14 thirds. So, you'll see, like, we have an, ex I have an example like that. You'll see what happens. Would you still want us, like, to graph it even though it's no solution? If it's no solution, it will be an empty graph. Yep. Questions? All right. So, the absolute value inequalities takes what we did yesterday and puts it together with what we're doing today. Okay? The absolute value, if the absolute value, so you're going to isolate the absolute value first. So if there's something on the front of the absolute value, before I determine if it's an and or an or, I'm going to get rid of it. So divide by two. Or if there was something added or subtracted at the end, I'm going to subtract or move it to the other side. The reason this is so important is because if this was a negative two and I divide by a negative, what happens to that sign? It flips. It flips. So it changes the direction of the sign. And the direction of the sign determines if it's an and statement or an or statement. If the absolute value is by itself and it is less than or less than or equal to a number, 
It's an and statement. So listen to the sound of the words in your head. Less than ends in an A-N. And and starts with an A-N. So hopefully, like, if you, like, think about it that way. If the absolute value is greater or greater than or equal to, I know it's not spelled that way, but think of how great or sounds, right? Great or is an or statement. Which means you have to take something, like, I'm going to start at basic. If this said less than three... Then I make it an and statement, which means I take the opposite of three, put it on the left. I make the sign go in the same direction, and I finish out the original. So an inequality with an absolute value, you have to determine if it's and or or, and then you have to build your and or or sign, or and or or statement. If that said absolute value of x was greater than three, now it becomes an or statement. I still do the negative 3. I still do the sign going in the same direction with the x. But then I stop, write or, and then follow through the rest of what's there without the absolute value. So the and is going to be a shaded in between where the or is going to point out like oars on a boat. So if you think about like you're riding a canoe and you've got oars. They go outside. That's what your graph's going to look like. So again, you have to isolate the absolute value first, and then you get to determine if it's and or or. Okay, so look at nine. Is the absolute value isolated? Yeah. Yes. Is this, read that out loud or read it in your head, absolute value of x minus five is less than two, which means this is gonna become what kind of statement? And the negative two goes on the left because of the absolute value. I put the sign in the same direction, which would be less than x minus 5, and then I finish out the rest of the statement, but I keep it all as 1 because it's an and statement. And then I'd add the 5 in all three spots. So I get 3 is less than x, which is less than 7. So 3 and 7, well, good. this part says greater than, so it's a parentheses pointing to the right. This part says less than, so it's a parenthesis pointing to the left, and I keep it where it overlaps, which would be in between. And my interval notation would be three to seven with parentheses on both. Okay, read the next one in your head, right? Absolute value of x plus three is what? Greater, greater or equal to seven, and greater means? Or. or. So the negative 7 goes on the left. I keep the sign going in the same direction. So open on the left. x plus 3. Then I or x plus 3 is greater than or equal to 7. So now I'm going to do the same steps. Negative 10 is greater than or equal to x. Or subtract the 3. x is greater than or equal to 4. On the left, our statement is reversed. So if we want to switch it again because our brains read left to right, I would be x is less than or equal to negative 10 or x is greater than or equal to 4. Then I do my graph. Negative 10, positive 4. Less than or equal to is a bracket on the negative 10 pointing to the left. Greater than or equal to is a bracket on the 4 pointing to the right. If it said and in between, this would be no solution, but because it says or, they both work. And my interval notation goes negative infinity to negative 10 with a bracket on the 10, union positive 4 with a bracket on the 4 to infinity with a parentheses on the infinity. All right, uh, do 11. All right, so for 11... It's already isolated. It's a less than statement, so it's an and statement. I put the negative 4 on the left, had the sign going in the same direction, and then solved it. You get 16 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 24. Brackets on the 16 and the 24 shaded in between. Raise your hand if you got it right. Good. Okay. So then with, negative, with number 12, you have to first divide by negative 3, which is why you can't determine if it's an and or or from the very beginning if there's anything outside that absolute value. Because this dividing by a negative 3 actually takes that sign and flips it. And I end up with absolute value of x minus 1 is less than or equal to 5. If you've done it from the beginning, this is greater than, which would have been an or statement. 
but because you divide by the negative three, it makes it become an and statement. So negative five is less than or equal to x minus one, which is less than or equal to five. Add the one in all three spots. And I get negative 4 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 6. So I'd get from negative 4 to positive 6, brackets on both, shaded in between. Raise your hand if you got that one right. Okay, good. Questions so far? Okay, so now we get into ones that kind of result in some special cases. And if you can spot them, it makes things a lot easier because it saves you a ton of time. If you can't spot them, then you'll see what would happen. We would figure it out. But if you can spot them, it will save you a ton of time. So like if you look at 13, right, if I divide both sides by negative 2 to start, I get the absolute value of x minus 1 is greater than or equal to negative 2. If I were to continue on this way, I would get an or statement, yes? And I would do the opposite of negative 2. So 2 is greater than or equal to x minus 1. Or x minus 1 is greater than or equal to negative 2. I would solve it. And I'd get x is less than or equal to 3. So I'd put a 3. I'd get a bracket on the 3. I'd point it to the left. Or x is greater than or equal to negative 1, I'd get a bracket on negative 1, I'd point it to the right. And what happened to my number line? I shaded that whole thing, and it's an or statement, so it's anywhere it's shaded. And this would be an all real numbers case. And my interval notation would be negative infinity to positive infinity. And I could have eliminated all of that work when I got to this statement. Because think about what that says. That says the absolute value something is going to be greater than or equal to negative 2. Is there any answer in which I take the absolute value, it would not be bigger than negative 2. Right? Any absolute value is going to be greater than a negative number. So if you get to that point, if it says absolute value of x is greater than or equal to a negative, your answer is all real numbers. Absolute value greater than or equal to a negative number absolute value greater than a negative number or absolute value greater than or equal to zero, this is all real numbers. Because every single number, when put into an absolute value, will come out positive, zero or greater than zero, which means all of those would be all real numbers. If you don't catch it, then you just do what we did. And you'd still get all real numbers. But it will obviously save you time to catch it. All right, go to 14. This says absolute value of x minus 1 is less than or equal to 0. So there's no such thing as the opposite of 0. I would put it's a less than. So I'd get a 0 on the left, less than or equal to x minus 1, which is less than or equal to 0. I'd add 1 to both sides. 1, x is, equal to, x is greater than or equal to 1, which is also less than or equal to 1. Now, there is only one number to put on this number line, which is the 1. The first part of this says it's greater than or, or sorry, yeah, x is greater than or equal to 1. So I'd get a bracket and I'd point it to the right. The second side of this, it says x is less than or equal to 1. I'd put a bracket on the 1 and I'd point it to the left. But it's an and statement, so it has to overlap. Does any part of that graph overlap? Just the 1. So the 1 is the only answer that works. On a number line, it would be 1 with a solid dot on it. And in interval notation, it's the number 1 with a bracket on either side. Yeah? Why was it not an Because it's less than. Right? This is less than. less than, it can't be Correct. If it was an or statement, it would be all real numbers again. Okay, what if it said, oh, let me actually take this one off. What if this, take off the or equal to there. What if it didn't have the or equal to there? I would get zero, less than two x minus one, which is less than zero. I'd add the one. Divide by two. Okay. 
On my number line, I'd only have the half. And this time it would be greater than is a parentheses to the right, less than parentheses to the left. The only thing that overlaps is the one half, but it's a parentheses. And what does a parentheses mean? Do we include that number? No, this is a no solution. So if you have, no, and no solution. So if you can spot it from the beginning, if it said less than <laughs> zero, or less than a negative number, less than zero, or less than a negative number, those would be no solution. Yeah. I know, I said change it. Otherwise, it'd be the same as 14. Like, it'd be the same answer. It would just be one half. God bless you. So we changed 15. We got rid of the or equal to so you could see what would happen if it was no solution. If it had the bracket, I mean, if it had the line underneath, then 15 and 14 would be like the same. It would just be a one half. Okay, now look at 16. What do we know about 16? What's true about every absolute value being greater than zero? All real numbers. Negative infinity to positive infinity. And my number line would be shaded in both directions. So a no solution that is going to be an empty number line. Whereas an all real number, the entire thing is shaded. Nope. So if you can catch it early, like on something like 16, it's going to help you. Something like four, 13, 14, they're going to help you to save some time. <laughs> if you can't catch it, you can always find it. Because it's an or statement, I would have been 0 is greater than 2x minus 1 or 2x minus 1 is greater than 0. And I'd have arrows pointing in both directions. But if you can catch it, it saves you a ton of time. Most of the questions on tonight's assignment will look something like this, where you get your inequality, and then you have to solve it. The inequality answer is going to be multiple choice, and then it's going to ask you to graph it on your number line. Please be careful. Make sure you're picking the parentheses or the brackets instead of the open dot and closed dot. Even though it doesn't ask for it, make sure you include the interval notation. in your work. All right, this is eight. So eight said, solve the equation, check your answers. So my least common denominator here would be 13 and then x plus nine. X cannot equal negative nine. So I'm gonna multiply this times x plus nine because that's what's missing from the denominator and this times 13 and the zero would get both, but it's still zero. So it's gonna cancel out. My numerator would be x plus 4 times x plus 9 on the left minus 13 times x plus 4 equals 0 times the whole de denominator, which is just 0. When you FOIL this out, you get x squared plus 13x plus 36. Distribute this, the negative goes to both. Negative 13x minus 52 equals 0. And then I get x squared, negative 13 and positive 13 cancel out. Positive 36 and negative 32, I mean negative 52, is negative 16. And then you can either factor that or you can use the even root, which says square root both sides, put a plus and minus. And I get x equals plus and minus 4. And then neither of those are negative 9, so those answers both work. You figure it out. All right, 11, you've got the absolute value equals something. So my first question would be x equals x squared plus x minus 99. And the other would be x, square, x equals, and I change the signs on all of these, negative x squared minus x plus 99. So on the left, I would subtract the x. Those cancel. I get x squared equals positive 99, square root both sides, putting a plus and minus. 99 is 9 and 11, so that's plus and minus 3, square root 11. And on the right, I'd subtract the x. Actually, I'd move the other side so that it's positive. Positive x squared, positive x, and negative 99. I get x squared plus 2x 
minus 99 equals 0. And then the factors of negative 99 that sum to 2 would be negative 9, positive 11. Split and solve, and I get 9 and negative 11. And then when you check them, like when you plug them back in, the negative 3 root 11 wouldn't work, and the 9 wouldn't work. So I'd end up with just the, so negative. I'd end up with just the positive 3 root 11 and negative 11. And the easiest way to check it would be to plug it back in just to the right side and see if it's negative. If I get a negative number, which is what would happen if I did the 9 or the negative 3 root 11, then it, you rule them out. You won't have to be checking like 3 root 11 for your test. All right, 13 and 14. So absolute value equals um, a polynomial here. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get x plus 1 equals what's there, x squared minus 5. And then x plus 1 equals the opposite of what's there, negative x squared plus 5. So subtract the x and the 1. I get 0 equals x squared minus x minus 6, which is negative 3 and positive 2. I get 3 and negative 2 from that. And then on the right, I'm going to move it the other direction, plus the x squared minus the 5. x squared plus x minus 4 equals 0. And there's no factors of negative 4 that sum to positive 1. So you have to either do the quadratic or complete the square. So negative b plus and minus the square root of b squared minus 4a. C all over 2 times a. Negative 1 plus and minus the square root of 1 plus 16 over 2 negative 1 plus and minus the square root of 17 over 2. And then those you'd have to check. And when you check them, the negative 2 doesn't work. And the positive and the negative 1 plus square root 17 over 2 doesn't work. So you keep the other two. Again, you won't have to be checking something like that for your test. The 3 and the negative 2, maybe, but not the other ones. So then 14, same thing, x minus 14 equals x squared minus 14x. And x minus 14 equals opposite, negative x squared plus 14x. Move the x and the 14. x, x minus 1, x minus 14, so it's 1 and 14. And then on the right-hand side, I'd move it the other way. X minus 14, X plus 1. And I get 14 and negative 1. When you check those, the 4 and the 1 don't work. 